everybody. So today we are going to be talking to an expert in the field. Paul Cleverly is somebody that focuses in geosciences and metadata and semantics and machine learning and LLMs and just being an overall like brilliant person to follow. And fun fact, I actually know Paul from way back in the day, we were doing our dissertation around the same time and somehow we got into the same circles of semantics and started talking. So I've known him for quite some time. I've been following him for quite some time. If you're not following him, make sure you do because he's doing some really brilliant stuff. So today we are going to be walking through some of his tips and tricks, you know, what his career is is like, some of the things that he been, he's been working on and overall just getting to know him a little bit better. So if you are interested in geosciences and or semantics, make sure you stick around. All right, so I am here with Paul and Paul is going to kick us off today. We're gonna to be talking about some things about semantics. Of course, semantics is a pretty broad topic, but um, we're going to get into some details with Paul on uh, the, the geo side of the house. So Paul, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Well, thank you, Ashley, and, and delighted to be invited onto your your, your channel. Um, so I feel privileged, all, all the people I've uh, I've watched in the past. Um, so my, my name is Paul Cleverly. I'm uh, a geologist and computer scientist by background. So I've always really done both of those disciplines rather than uh, be being one of those and then learning the other. Uh, and I, I help organizations leverage their unstructured data uh, to generate opportunities for natural resource uh, exploration, natural resources. So I involve consulting, sometimes I do some research, sometimes I do coding, uh, sort of move up and down the levels, uh, and involves all sorts of things like search engines, natural language processing, and um, other things that I'm sure we'll, we'll get <laughs> on to we'll talk cover. about. Well, and and I, uh, I just have to say to the audience that this is like a... a a crowning achievement for me because Paul is on the channel. I mean, there's a lot of other folks out there that, you know, of course are very notable, well-known characters, but my personal story with Paul is he and I know each other from way back when we were doing our dissertations and uh, we've been in contact here and there throughout the years, but we never had a chance to sit down and talk. And so he has been such a, a bright light in the semantic community for myself and I know for others um, throughout the years. So I wanted to just throw that out, not to make you blush, Paul, <laughs> for what you do. No, no, like, likewise, likewise. I mean, it's, it's nice to have a peer group and, yeah, you know, we, we all connect with each other without uh, actually, you know, actually seeing each other, so to speak, sometimes <laughs> in these in these networks and uh, I mean I, I think I always I also like the opportunity to talk a little bit about geoscience because um, you know sometimes it gets a little bit of a bad press of just extracting uh, things and causing lots of pollution but you know really geoscience is, is connected to so many things you know mm -hmm. yes there's critical minerals um, you know copper is is the metal of electrification and if we're going to achieve any of these net zero targets and mm -hmm. fight climate change we need to find you know a lot more of just about everything, so people can, uh, uh, you know, still have uh, energy in their homes and so on. Uh, but but also other things, you know, geohazards, climate change uh, affecting people, drinking water. Not everybody realizes just how many people on this planet don't have access to, to clean drinking yeah. water and the role that, uh, you know, geoscience can play, uh, you know, within that. So so I think geoscience is, is very much, you know, society's future lies uh, somewhat in the subsurface in many different uh, uh, for many different reasons. So, I, I I wanted to get that in 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 the beginning. Um, and just a, a few other things about me. I, I volunteer, uh, teach uh, business analytics at Robert Gordon University uh, in Aberdeen, uh, and I also volunteer uh, for Geoscience World, which is a nonprofit cooperative in in Washington D.C., which uh, manages a lot of the geoscientific literature and uh, and and other Anything around natural language processing, I'm, I'm always keen to to uh, to to share and uh, uh, and volunteer. And and I love that that there there's a lot of folks in in our space. I think that they do so many things outside of just their regular day job to to kind of get the word out and you know dabble and just have like you said peer groups. It's a very, in my opinion, very welcoming community. I have not seen too many um, ivory towers stood up 
to block people from getting into into the the semantic space. Um, so that's that's nice. I'm sure there's some out there. I'm sure, but for the most part, we're all we're all a nice, happy kind of group. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about semantics, so Paul, I mean, when you get into semantics, I feel like everybody has a different story to tell. How did they get into it? Why did they get into it? So what's what's your story? Well, I'm not going to go too far back. Well, I am, but, <laughs> but not for very long. So so uh, probably people are not that interested. But I, I uh, when I was a child, really, my, my two great passions were geology and computer science. It's been an absolute privilege to spend virtually all my entire career doing the two things that, that I uh, liked when I was a child. I remember finding my first fossil uh, on a beach when I was seven, uh, Gryphea, Devil's Toenail, uh, Brachiopod, and of course, the, the interest in fossils as paleontology has remained. And uh, paleontology, of course, is you know the study of ancient life's rooted in taxonomies, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of classification. And then I, I was also fortunate to be you know, around the time of the birth of home computing in around 1984. And, uh, you know, I, I just enjoyed the, the, the logic and also the creativity that the mm -hmm. programming, uh, you know, uh, uh, gives us. So I think, uh, you know, I took those two. I I did them at degree master's level. Um, and I, I, I was really fascinated how we could teach computers about geoscience. And, of course, back then we were talking mm – -hmm. The, the you know early nineties, mm -hmm. teaching is is not quite the same as uh, maybe <laughs> uh, what we talk about. But um, well, this is really sort of started getting involved in in, in semantics. And I think it's part of our human nature, isn't it? That we're you know we're lumpers and splitters. We like to you know group things together, and then we like to split them apart. <laughs> and uh, you know the, the the discipline of geology, a big part of that is is uh, uh, related to that. So. I think for some things I'm a lumper, but uh, I think things I'm really interested in, I'm, I'm a bit of a splitter, you know, in terms <laughs> of uh, getting in the really nitty uh, minutiae of uh, uh, of things. So um, I yeah. do, and, I, I do love that characteristic about you, where you, you very clearly say like, these are the things that I was very interested in, and then I think about all the posts that I see from you. I'm like, yep, see lots of fossils. Yep, see lots of NLP. Yep, so it's very on. <laughs> Sometimes it's a very it's a very uh, tangential excuse to get something in there, but uh, I I yeah I mean when I it's interesting we talk digital transformation and so on and I think when I when I was starting back in ni early nineteen nineties people used crayons they literally used crayons to draw maps mm -hmm. and everything was by hand mm -hmm. interpreting images of the subsurface and we had this first great wave really of digital transformation of workstations mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, that that was it was very interesting to be involved in that, and I really found that I quite enjoyed you know that sort of uh, aspect. And of course, when and I can almost put it back to about 1995, you know, when PowerPoint arrived, and for for good or for bad, probably a lot of people would say bad. People abandoned doing proper reports, and uh, there was an explosion, uh, an exponential explosion of suddenly, you know, rather than handing in your work. For a central group in an organization to produce something people could produce things themselves you know we hear a lot of that that democratization word mm -hmm. well you know everybody was a publisher mm -hmm. so we had this explosion in word and powerpoint which is still going on and uh of course that then led to well how are we going to find all this stuff mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. in the past you might have said well show me all the reports in this area and you, you might end up with you know a hundred and of course those manual things couldn't do that so that's when, uh, so, so I spent a lot of time around search engines and mm -hmm. like you, I did my PhD late in, late in life. I, I uh, around 10 years ago, started looking at enterprise search. Um, the advantage of doing it later was I could use real, real industry data, Yeah. Um, you know, because of the connections and really to, to understand, you know, what the challenges were, you know, of course, semantics plays a big part of trying to. Mm -hmm you know, understand the language between a person and a computer. Um, and, you know, in those days, well, in fact, even, even today, people type one or two words in and expect to magically find what they're after. Yeah. And uh, I just think, you know, if you went into a library and you just shouted a word at the <laughs> librarian there, you know, would they really understand what it was that you're, you know, you're, you're after? <laughs> so yeah. I think that's, um, you know, of course, that's evolved. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's that's really brought us up to present day yeah 
I mean, there's been a lot to, of sophistication, uh, you know, throughout the years that have added to this, right, in the library space where, you know, I, I, I teach cataloging classification sometimes at, at library schools. And one of the things that, you know, we, we always have to bridge the gap between cataloging and classification because the cataloging is usually physical stuff on a shelf somewhere, which has one normally physical copy and it's in that space and it has to belong in that space. It has to make sense in that space. But then when you talk about digital, well, and this is a perfect example. This is a real story. Um, I was looking for a book and it was uh, for a course and it was specifically the uh, tourism in Ireland, the history of the tourism in Ireland. So I was like, is it in history? Is it in tourism? Or is it in like the geographic stuff? And it ended up being in tourism. And I said, well, someone made a decision there, <laughs> right? But in a digital space, it could live in all three yeah. because it has a lot to do with all three. So it's it's very fascinating to see how, to your point, like the physicality of things and how it's then been morphed so that it fits into more of a digital ecosystem is kind of fascinating to see and how we're still stuck in many cases <laughs> in, in one or the other. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the the... When there was less volumes, you know, you could browse them. You know, used to call browse the stacks, didn't you? And you know, digitally, of course, you could browse them in different ways. The space is now so large yeah. that um, you know now now in between us are algorithms that decide, yeah. you know, what what is uh, what is it that you should be looking at. Mm -hmm. And I think that's. Uh, I mean, there's some. You know, Floridi's written some great stuff on information, um, philosophy of information. Mm -hmm. You know that that. Uh, algorithm accountability in so many different ways will probably be one of the big challenges of our time. Uh, and I think that's an also an area of research for anyone involved in information science is, yeah. you know, the, the, the manipulation of the algorithms to show you interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, and stuff how it, you, you wouldn't see. Yeah. And how it, it shapes you, because I think so many people do not realize how much it's it's affecting what you actually observe for any given interface that, that you're on. And in many cases, um, a lot of younger people, um, like teenage age <laughs> folks, um, you know, and not to say like only t teenagers are watching TikTok, that's not true. But I myself have a lot of experience now with a teenager and TikTok. <laughs> but I'm finding is they actually get freaked out. A lot of the, the teenagers that, that I see and talk to in my day-to-day -day life, they actually get freaked out when they themselves have to pick something. So they actually are so now pre-programmed because of some of those algorithms that they just, they just scroll and they get the offerings that are served up to them and they don't want to pick because there's just too much to pick or they just don't know how or it gives them anxiety to pick. Uh, yeah, let me tell you, yeah. trying to pick a movie on name, name your streaming service any given night is torture it's like an hour trying to pick something just because no one knows what they want to watch but it's it's fascinating right how these these algorithms are even affecting just our regular lives outside of the computer right and it's it's so interesting that yeah i i i wish i was more in tune with some of the courses that are being taught right now in library sciences to see how they're tackling some of these topics indeed and of course talk about algorithms is a nice segue to my my own company <laughs> yeah yeah um, so you do have a company and i want to have you on the honest review series at some point but what is it what is it that that, that you have uh so yeah company is uh info science technology limited it is not a giant conglomerate it is in fact really uh just myself um <laughs> I, I founded it in 2018 mm -hmm. and uh developing natural language processing algorithms and the aim was to try and detect the sort of insights and opportunities, you know, targeting unstructured text and of geoscience, predominantly information, that, this, that, that really people would never read through classic search engines. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it is, you know, looking for patterns. So, you know, where do we find this plus this plus that? Mm -hmm. um, a sort of, you know, automated situational awareness for the discipline that, uh, that I'm involved in, mm -hmm. and, and I, I like to frame things in in sort of different models. And I, I've always used Marchionini's, although it's for search engines. I think it's quite useful even in in Gen AI as well. Mm -hmm. So so Marchionini's groupings, you know, of um, you know, and, and 
the, the, the look up known item search, the mm-hmm. search goal, where there's a right answer. Um, if you sort of look at it, it's around 80% on average volume queries in a, in a company. People tend to be doing that. So you might find a particular answer to a document, you know, like, you know, where, where's the Hoover Dam? You know, there's a right answer to that question. Mm-hmm. And then there's around 20% by volume, smaller, but potentially higher value, where they're exploratory search goals. So there's no right answer. Like, um, you know, what are the links between dams and induced earthquakes and landslides? And so it could be that based on your knowledge, the information that is of most value to you is on page 32 of a PDF that's on page 25 of your search results. Yep. So you would never normally read it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, how, how do you sort of surface those those nuggets? So um, really connected a little bit to my research, my PhD, of, you know, the people side of it. So what, what, mm-hmm. what do people find useful, interesting, and one of the latent needs mm-hmm. that have from scientists or geoscientists was, you know, show me something that I don't already know. You know, that's a hard one because, you know, what, you know, what one geologist may know is different to another, but yep. there's definitely certain algorithms that have a, a sort of propensity to surface these nuggets of useful mm-hmm. info that, that, that others uh, uh, don't like. And uh, <laughs> I think that's something that I, that I've you know spent a bit of time on. I think uh, in this sort of sea of information, it's uh you know, an area I'm sure that will, you know, have, have further research as well. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's a lot of complications to that too. I mean, that's, that's always the, the, the promised land, right? Like, oh, well, we can find all the, the, the little nuggets in all the content, wherever they may be. And, you know, any, anything that we can do to get closer to that is, is great. I know personally dealing a lot in search and content myself, you know, there's still a lot of not sexy things that we got to figure out before we get there, right? So as an example, OCR, you know, some things are just gross and they can't get the, the, the OCR is so gnarly on them. I have seen recent uh, research talking about LLMs actually improving the quality of OCR uh, data. So that's good, right? So we're making progress. But yeah, I mean, if you, if, if, there, if your search engine literally cannot index a piece of content or a, a piece of information within the content, you don't have a lot of hope in finding it unless you have human annotation going on. Uh, uh, absolutely. And I, I, I never, you know, it's not much I can add to the OCR, you know, sort <laughs> right. of uh, uh, debate, but, but I started to get into it because people would just give me a whole bunch of documents and say, run your algorithms on these. Yeah. And some of them were dumb PDFs and, you know, others were readable, but the images weren't. So, mm-hmm. so I sort of got involved in that. And I, I think one, you know, one area once you once you, once you've got that you know, sort of readable text, you know, can be you know as well as finding things, is sort of sentiment and tone, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I'll, I'll come back to some geological examples, but maybe ones that people you know can relate to. Um, you know, if you're if you're looking for sinkholes, you, you obviously want to detect where it says an absence of sink, sinkholes, for example. So you've got the 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 fact that the you know the the, the realm doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so to speak, or negation, however much you want mm-hmm. to call it, and then you've got you know possible sinkholes or sinkholes with a question mark after, you know, the sort of a speculation yeah. rather than, you know, there are this is a prolific area of sinkholes. Mm-hmm. So some of these things again can feed into this, you know, what people might find interesting. I mean, if something is prolific or proven or world class, mm-hmm. is a world class reserve. You know, well, most people are going to know that. So you know, there's some um, there's some little levers there that can mm. be uh, that could be you know pulled, uh, and also the, the the mentioning people like informative information instances. Mm-hmm. If you just say, you know, there's some rocks and cliffs and they're black and they're grey, you know that's okay. But if there's something that's talking about, say, a Kimridge clay formation, which is an actual instance, mm-hmm. ontological mm-hmm. individual, you know. So what my algorithms do really is take some of these concepts and. You, know, you find one thing in a sentence, you find another, you've got two nodes, and then you've got an mm-hmm. edge if they're mm-hmm. related. So, you know, up pops your, you, 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 you hydrate your knowledge graph, mm-hmm. um, which can then, you know, power some insights. So, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, that's, that's really a lot of what I've been, um, you know, sort of doing. And, and I, I, I was inspired by some of this, doing some of these things of looking at the entire corpus, mm-hmm. you know, rather than just, classifying a document 
mm-hmm. or finding an entity. I just want to take mm-hmm. everything and then see if there was knowledge by taking everything that mm-hmm. that wasn't in any single report. And a lot of what inspired me was was the work that Swanson did in the ni- mid 1980s mm-hmm. in uh, literature based uh, discovery or LBD. Mm-hmm. And he did it manually. There was no automation. And he looked at medical literature and uh, he, in the ABC technique. So he found magnesium deficiency in migraines. And they were never actually explicitly mentioned together, but mm-hmm. they shared common concepts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he, he postulated that there was a link between magnesium deficiency and migraines, headaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, many years later, he was proved correct empirically. <laughs> so, you know, there's an example where, you know, proven, uh, mm-hmm. Even back then, that uh, you know, there's there's meaning to to. Uh, in fact, if, if any large collection of information, you know, that there's meaning in it as a, as a whole, yep. which we don't know yet. Uh, you know, and then you got that that end of the spectrum, you know, big picture, and then on the minutiae, I probably spend a lot of my time on word sense disambiguation, which is the, <laughs> yeah, you know, the the, the, uh, the 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 crux of all. Um, you know, it's really when when regex becomes yeah. inefficient and you have to go to natural language processing. Yeah. If you're talking about source, people use shorthand info, as you know, in text. So are they talking about the source of information or the source of sand or the, the yeah. source of uh, hydrocarbons? So I, I, I find that's also um, roll up your sleeves yeah. sort of, uh, you know, way of, uh, of doing it. And language models don't solve everything. Yeah. And, you know, that's that specifically, the entity resolution piece. I'm always floored that in the semantic space, that's not as discussed as, you know, oh, there's these relationships and then connect things. You can do multi hops and, you know, all of that stuff that we always talk about. But the the entity resolution piece, like the graph itself can help you with that. Right. Like what's what are the nearest neighbors of this thing? So that you can start to figure out what are the different attributes between two different things and, and figure out which one is which. Um, you know, and even if you don't have that, like, you know, I, I try to avoid talking about AI nowadays because it's in everything. Um, but, you know, in the LLM situation where there, there's grounding off of a knowledge graph, LLM doesn't know if you're talking about Michael Jordan, the basketball player or the actor. So you got to figure out who that is before you send it to be grounded on anything. Uh, and, you know, that goes for the full text, which is a lot of what you're talking about here, even though, you know, it's not an AI use case per se. What, 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 one of my little mini missions uh, at the moment on retrieval augmented generation or RAG is really to try and explain to people where they are applying a language model on their, their own content mm-hmm. um, because they want to security trim it. Mm-hmm. So it's no, good building, it's no good building an LLM because you, you can't then split out who can see what. They want it to be up to date. So if information comes in like next week, they, they want to be able to find it. Well, no good building model because it would be out of date. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, there's lots of reasons to build a model. I'm just saying yeah. why people yeah. use RAG. One of the, the, you know, the key bits of RAG that, you know, I, I don't think at least everybody is aware is that the usefulness of your answer is already predetermined by the information retrieval process that's mm-hmm. happened Instead, of course, on documents, it's on chunks Mm -hmm. and it's using similarity. Mm -hmm. But that is heavily influenced by metadata tagging and semantics. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, semantics to metadata and taxonomies and long span co-reference and all, they are as if not more important in an AI world than, you know, that they've ever been. And I, I think the, the, the part of it is this education to, uh, and I've done some with senior execs, is that with large language models, there's two ways you can build your model. Everything goes in there, benefits, drawbacks, mm-hmm. or you can take your own content mm-hmm. and the, the LLM just gets the answers from your own content mm-hmm. and those are vectorized. But the, the, the way those chunks are, because it only really ever uses the first five to 10 that I've seen, in, at least in a paragraph summary. So... Yeah. It's it, it, it very tuned to, to manipulation. Yeah. So uh, it comes down to good old IR, yeah. good old metadata. Yep. Um, and there's my, I'll get off the soapbox. <laughs> so. um, you and I are on the soapbox together there, Paul, because I have a whole video talking about that exact topic. So what's 
if, if you could describe what's some of the unique things that sets that apart from other types of semantics or other ways that people are using semantics. Yes, I think with geoscience, earth science, geology, um, you know, and like some subjects, a lot of knowledge doesn't go out of date. So you can find mm. something from 100, 100 years ago, it could be very, very useful. You know, I doubt you could find something on computer programming uh, from, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago that, you know, apart from being historical, interesting artifact would probably influence what, what people mm -hmm. do. So there's there's a bit of a difference and perhaps some other scientific disciplines also move at that pace. Ge geoscience is a little bit different. Um, I'd also say, you know, ge geology is a bit of a descriptive science. So, um, you know, semantics like the geological time scale. I mean, everyone's heard of the Jurassic. Mm -hmm. You know, what comes be before the Jurassic is Triassic. What comes after the Jurassic is Cretaceous. Hope I've got that right. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'm going to be real. And don't trouble. listen to Jurassic <laughs> Park because half of the dinosaurs are not from the Jurassic period. <laughs> it, indeed, but we have this. We have this chronostratigraphy uh, uh, um, structure which is global. So someone can be doing something over one part of the world uh, and they can relate that because it's the same age as over another part of the world. So the, you know, there are very you know, key things from an international uh, you know, point of view. Um, and I, I think this, this other you know, element, of, as well as time, of course, deep time is space. Really, they're too, mm -hmm. too, deep, too, too key for geoscientists. So when I say time, you know, I mean going back 4 billion you know, odd years, uh, that's just the Earth. When I say space, I don't just mean like a latitude, longitude. I just mean the sub the subsurface. And of course, because the the plates have been moving over time, you know what what was uh, you know a point in space today, you know like parts of the UK were, were over the equator several hundred million years ago. So, mm -hmm. I think from a geoscience point of view, you've got this you know time and space element, which gives you a structure over virtually everything that you mm -hmm. you know you, you 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 then find and there's there's a recent element i say a third element to this where fantastic uh, presentations from from ian stewart a scottish geologist made many television programs for the bbc uh, i think he's ambassador for unesco at the moment and he he i saw a presentation of his where you know lots of pictures of geology if you ask people about it you know there's you see there's dinosaurs, there's, you know, the Grand Canyon, there's, you know, caves. And and they're all they're all barren of people. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a sort of a shift now with 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 more researchers to, you know, go towards social geoscience with mm -hmm. connecting it to the, the, the people side of things and the impact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of uh, uh, of what people do. Um so I think those are, you know, some some interesting um, you know, different. Yeah, I mean that—that's you know, a totally different perspective. Yeah. When when we usually talk about time series data on this channel, we're talking about like IoT and manufacturing plants. You're like a billion billion years ago. <laughs> totally different than what a lot of folks would be uh, familiar with from a time series uh, sort of perspective. You're dealing a totally different um, measurements of time than than others. <laughs> Indeed, and of course, I mean, if you're doing like earthquake monitoring and things, you you, ge you generate time series in real time. But but a lot of uh, a lot of geoscience is, is abductive. You're mm -hmm. trying to you're, you're like an earth detective, <laughs> you know, because you can't see what happened, mm -hmm. you know, ten million years ago. Yeah, you can see the results mm -hmm. of what may have happened. So you try and look around and piece together, and then come up with a plausible explanation for what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, sometimes you just don't have the data. So you have to come up with some models that that can then fill in the gaps. It's you have so much experience. I know you also teach. What are some pieces of, of advice that you maybe would, you know, give to, to anyone trying to maybe get into this space? Well, it's very hard. I mean, I would say, uh, you know, things have things changed, but but <laughs> I, I was I was fortunate that I, I was one of these what might be called T-shaped people you know, that they call them, where you, you have reasonable knowledge in more than one discipline. Mm -hmm. Mine happen to be computer science and geoscience. And I think, to be honest, that's um, probably more important now than it was, you know, back then. So I think for people, you probably have many different careers. Um, a lot of innovation happens at the interfaces of different disciplines and so on. Mm -hmm. So so I think, you know, try, try and get some reasonable in-depth in a number of 
you know different uh, uh, different areas. Um, programming, I get a lot from students. You know, how do I get into programming Python? And I think it depends on your learners. Some people like to do the courses. I bought all the books and then never opened them when I retaught myself uh, during my PhD. I, I think programming is one of those things. You know, it's not like building a house mm. or performing an operation on someone. There's no penalty for making a mistake. Yeah. So um, just, you know, download uh, Python or R or, you know, whatever. And just there's so much out there. Just start experimenting mm. uh, and and just learn by doing that. That's that's mm. my style. It's not everybody's style. Uh, but I would just say, you know, don't don't be, oh, you know, I've never done this before. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just just have a go. It's a lot easier than people think. There's a lot of no code solutions. So even if you think I am not a coder, I will never be a coder. That's fine. I mean, yep. you can do some amazing things with deep learning, yep. state-of-the-art, with taxonomies, knowledge engineering, without ever writing a single line of code. Absolutely. Some amazing tools out there. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, uh, and I said my last, my last point would be don't, don't forget about the soft skills because, yeah. you know, you can have great ideas, but you've got to be able to communicate them to people and persuade. And, and I, if someone, if one thing that I wish people had told me back when I started my career was just how important those those things are. You need to be a salesperson. Mm-hmm. You need to be a marketeer. You need to be able to persuade, bring people along with you, you know. And I think if you can, if you have those skills and you're technical, then uh, I think it, it, it really sets you up mm-hmm. for, you know, a, a great, a great, uh, a great career. Yeah, those are those are great. And um, I, I would second a lot of those is I always tell people just dive in, play around. There's so many open tools out there. If you're if you're not a programmer, or if you are a programmer, even there's lots of libraries, you can, you know, see what other people do. Um, there's so many sandboxes now out there that you can just play around with different use cases. And yes, don't forget the soft skills, because um, if you cannot communicate your findings or why they matter to your organization or, you know, why is this of impact to scholarship? Nobody knows how amazing that thing is that you just did. right? So that's, that's so important. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you, you're always competing, you know, with your idea or your project with, with other people's, you know, for investment, yeah. for attention. And some people think, well, it doesn't matter. I'm in a big company. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a technology vendor. I don't need to, you know, learn marketing sales. But you you have to learn marketing sales inside big companies because yeah, you you, you have uh, people people perhaps don't think of it like that. Yeah, you know, they think, oh, there's the service sector, and then there's you know other companies that they you know. I mean, everybody has a customer. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. I think if you, you know, think like that uh, and learn those soft skills. Um, develop them uh, I think very valuable all right and with that I want to thank you very much and I'll catch you next time